trial of the is now in session. Please be seated. Good afternoon and welcome to the four o'clock session of the Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, for counsel, um, feel free to stay seated or stand up. Um, as you make your argument, you can take your mask off or leave it on. Um, thanks to the leadership of our presiding judge, John Everett Williams, we are uh, streaming this on YouTube and he's made it so that we are, um, and to Mr. Clerk over there, as well that we are available to do this in person during this time of a pandemic and I for one think that's great uh, that we're able to sit here and have court in person. Um, so with that I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, to my left um, is our presiding judge John Everett Williams from Carroll County and to my right is Judge Camille McMullen from Shelby County and I am Ross Dyer also from Shelby County. Uh, again, 20 minutes aside, feel free to stand or sit. And Mr. Clerk, if you'll call the last case of the day, please, sir. State of Tennessee versus John Edward Wilson, Jr. Oh, Counsel, if you'd like to reserve time for rebuttal, if you'd let me know. Yes, Your Honor, I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please. May it please the court. Good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Chelsea Curtis, and I serve as the Deputy Executive Director of the Tennessee District Public Defenders Conference. I'm here today on behalf of the appellant, Mr. John Edward Wilson, Jr. I'm here today to ask this court to consider my client's request for judicial diversion because the trial court failed to do so. I know that your honors are familiar with my brief as well as the state's brief, but I thought for the benefit of those who may be watching, it may be valuable to briefly go over the facts of this case. On November 3rd, 2018, Linda Owens called 911 to report she was holding a man at gunpoint after she awoke to him standing naked in her bedroom. The man, later identified as Mr. Wilson, reported that his uncle, Leslie Garner, bet him $300 to enter Miss Owens' house and run through the home naked. Mr. Wilson stated in his allocution at a sentencing hearing that he never intended to touch or hurt Miss Owens. Mr. Wilson told the investigating officer who prepared the pre-sentence report that he was just going to scare Ms. Owens. Notably, Mr. Wilson had no criminal history and he was eligible for judicial diversion. Ms. Owens did not submit a victim impact statement, nor did she testify at the sentencing hearing. At the sentencing hearing, the prosecutor remarked regarding Ms. Owens, I really wish she had been here today. I don't know, I don't know what happened, but I really wish she had been here today. So no one who testified at the sentencing hearing was present in Ms. Owens' home on November 3rd, 2018. Thus, information regarding what happened in Ms. Owens' home on that night is limited to what was included in the pre-sentence report and Mr. Wilson's allocution at the sentencing hearing. The pre-sentence report includes a statement by Mr. Wilson and an agency statement, which consists of the affidavit of complaint by Deputy Jonathan McDowell of the Weekly County Sheriff's Department. There were no enhancement factors listed in Mr. Wilson's pre-sentence report. Consistent with Mr. Wilson's allocution and statements to police, the strong R stated that Mr. Wilson had not displayed any threatening, aggressive, or violent behaviors within the last five years, that Mr. Wilson did not have a history of threatening, aggressive, or violent behaviors, and that Mr. Wilson had never threatened or injured anyone with a weapon. At the sentencing hearing, the state did not call any witnesses. Mr. Wilson called his mother and TDOC probation officer, Brandon Bookout, to testify. Defense counsel and the state agreed that Mr. Wilson was qualified for judicial diversion. However, the state noted an objection um, to granting diversion. Now, defense counsel argued that Mr. Wilson should be granted judicial diversion, or at the very least that he be sentenced to time served. Mr. Wilson was a range one standard offender and he faced a sentence range of three to six years on the aggravated burglary conviction. Despite Mr. Wilson's eligibility for judicial diversion and alternative sentencing, the trial court ordered Mr. Wilson to serve five years in confinement. The trial court did not address Mr. Wilson's request for diversion. Mr. Wilson's trial counsel requested judicial diversion. They provided proof in the form of a form approved by the TBI that was submitted into evidence, yet the trial court did not consider or address diversion whatsoever. In fact, the trial court never once mentioned the word diversion throughout the entire sentencing hearing. 
The trial court's failure to address Mr. Wilson's request for judicial diversion removes any presumption of reasonableness of the trial court's implicit denial of diversion. And I say implicit because again, Mr. Wilson's request was never directly addressed. Mr. Wilson re respectfully requests that upon de novo review, this court grant judicial diversion to Mr. Wilson. When the defendant requests diversion, the trial court is required to perform a diversion analysis. The state has in fact conceded that de novo review is appropriate in this case because the trial court failed to properly consider and weigh the relevant factors in denying judicial diversion. However, the state and Mr. Wilson do not agree how the relevant factors ought to be considered and weighed, but those issues are thoroughly addressed in our briefs. However, I would like to point out that the two most important factors were not properly considered by the trial court. The first being Mr. Wilson's amenability to correction. Again, Mr. Wilson had no criminal history whatsoever, and he apologized for his behavior during his elocution, demonstrating his amenability to correction. The trial court did not address that factor at all. With regard to his prior criminal record or lack thereof, the trial court stated only that it took into consideration the lack of a previous criminal history. The trial court then moved on without making any findings regarding his lack of criminal history or how it weighed in the court's analysis. This court held in 2005 in State v. Thompson that a defendant's criminal history is a critical factor to consider in evaluating his or her amenability to correction, and it is the primary focus required in evaluating a request for pretrial diversion. It is entirely unclear from the record how the trial court considered this critical factor as it was not explained, it was not weighed, it was not balanced against any other factors. Importantly, both Mr. Wilson and the state also agree that the record is sufficient for de novo review. And I'll briefly go over what is included in the record. At the sentencing hearing, the state agreed that Mr. Wilson was diversion eligible, but argued he should not be granted diversion. The state did not call any witnesses or put on any proof. Mr. Wilson's trial counsel called the Tennessee Department of Correction probation and parole officer Brandon Bookout to testify as a defense witness and to discuss the pre-sentence report. Mr. Bookout affirmed that Mr. Wilson had no criminal history, that he displayed a good attitude, that he scored extremely low for aggression on his strong R assessment, and that he believed Mr. Wilson would do fine on probation. Trial, court, trial counsel for Mr. Wilson pointed out during the direct examination of Mr. Bookout that a diversion eligibility form was entered into evidence. And trial counsel also questioned Mr. Bookout and asked whether the diversion eligibility form was included in the pre-sentence report, which Mr. Bookout testified that it was not because he was not asked to include it. However, he did agree that Mr. Wilson had no record. By all of this, trial counsel proved that Mr. Wilson was a suitable candidate for judicial diversion. So now we'll go over what is not in the record. There is no substantial evidence to support the refusal of judicial diversion by the trial court. While the trial court performed a rote recitation of a couple of the general sentencing considerations, the trial court failed to engage with the facts of the case, they failed to engage with Mr. Wilson's arguments, and they completely failed to weigh or balance any of the few factors that the court did address. The trial court did not articulate or place in the record the specific reasons for its determination to deny diversion. The trial court's absolute failure to address Mr. Wilson's request for diversion constitutes a clear abuse of discretion, and I ask that the trial court's ruling be reversed and that this court grant Mr. Wilson's request for judicial diversion on de novo review. Why wouldn't we just send it back and tell the trial judge to, to, to do its job? I mean, both of y'all basically seem to be arguing, you arguing, the state conceding, that the trial judge just didn't do what it was supposed to do. Why wouldn't we just send it back and say, here's the directive, remind you of what you're supposed to do, and do it, rather than us doing that when they're in the better position. They've, they've, they've lived with this case. This is our first time to see this case. Yes, Your Honor, I, I'm sure that that would be one way to do it, but I do believe that the record is sufficient and complete in its current form um, to be reviewed de novo. Um, I do believe that would be the more expedient option. Um, well, it, it, did Mr. Buckout testify that there were three areas of high risk and two areas of moderate risk for reoffending? 
I don't believe it was for reoffending, Your Honor, but I do believe that there were areas that Mr. Wilson um, scored as a higher moderate risk on the strong R. Yes, sir. But the so areas. That, so that would weigh against him. Not necessarily. I think the strong R assessment, the, the factors of the strong R that I believe have the most weight are those that do indicate whether or not the person is likely to reoffend. And I think the most significant factor, as this court has found, is their lack of criminal history or their amenability to correction. In the areas, um, in those areas, what were the three areas with high risk? The court's indulgence for a moment. Mr. Wilson scored as a high risk for mental health, and then he only scored as a moderate risk on his residential and family. And I will say that it's in the record, Mr. Wilson was in foster care from the age of seven to 18. And that was discussed during the sentencing hearing. So it said it was three areas of high risk. What, all three areas were in mental health? No, it looks like the one area is mental health, residential and family appears to me to be on the moderate scale, but I guess it could be leaking over into high, but it looks like moderate. But yeah, he, he was definitely high on the mental health um, range and then moderate to high on residential and family. And again, I will say the residential and family, I believe stems from his transience um, because he was in and out of foster care. And at the time of this offense, Mr. Wilson was 20 years old. I believe at the time of the sentencing hearing, he was 21. He was a young man coming out of foster care at age 18. Um, so I don't find the residential and family surprising given that history. But I believe the, the low or non-existent strong R for aggression um, should weigh very heavily in this case, given what he's accused of doing. Um, there was no finding of aggression. That's all I have, Your Honors. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Ronald Coleman on behalf of the state. It appears the defendant uh, has so chosen to only um, argue the first issue regarding judicial diversion and not the denial of probation. So the state will rely on its brief regarding the denial of probation. Turning to the denial of judicial diversion, uh, this is a situation where the trial court apparently determined it was a, a foregone conclusion and, and did err by not analyzing the judicial diversion factors. To your question, Judge Dyer, the state has no opposition whatsoever to this court remanding and saying, court, you forgot to look at this, look at this, analyze the factors, put, you know, discuss the weights and make a decision. That is uh, wholly within this court's discretion and there would be nothing wrong with that. Um, we do, however, uh, the state submits that the evidence in this record is overwhelmingly supportive of the idea that diversion um, should not be granted to the defendant. And that this court, when it looks at the record, can clearly see that and make its own determination without having to go through the other steps. But again, that is entirely up to this court. Um, to your question, Judge Williams, I wanted to make sure I answered that. The, the, what were the areas of risk? The, the three different areas of high risk were the defendant's mental health, the defendant's residential situation, and the defendant's family situation. Um, and that was testified uh, to by Mr. Bookout. And then there were the two areas of moderate risk were the areas of his employment and his education. And that was based on the fact that he had had primarily negative employment relationships, uh, was unemployed but able to work, had no legal income, and had been fired from or quit a job in at, least, uh, at least once due to poor performance or attitude. That goes towards his employment. And his education uh, was that he, though he had a high school diploma, he saw no need for additional education. So those were the different areas of, of the risk. Um, unless this court wants me to go over every single analysis, every single one of the seven Parker and electroplating factors, I think our brief fully covers that, but uh, the defendant emphasized what is in the record versus what is not in the record. And I think some, there are some things that are worth uh, pointing out. First was that there are multiple areas of high or moderate risk um, to at least violate the conditions of diversion or probation. Uh, 
the circumstances of this offense were also especially egregious. The defendant didn't just, he was committed, uh, he was convicted of aggravated burglary um, and he didn't just break into an individual's home. He broke into an individual's home in the middle of the night while that victim was in the house, while that victim was in fact sleeping, and then he proceeded to stand over that victim naked. So the trial court consider, or um, this court should consider that the circumstances of the offense were especially egregious. Um, several, several other admissions by the defendant are that he admitted that he drank underage and that he uses drugs, that um, he's recently lived in a community where antisocial activity is frequent, that he has primarily negative employment relationships, um, and that he uh, was motivated to commit crime for excitement, amusement, fun, attention, and money. Uh, so those are some of the things that are in the record, and that's why the state submits that this uh, overwhelmingly supports the denial of judicial diversion, whether this court wants to do that or wants to send it back down to the trial court. If there are no further questions, uh, as I said, the state will rely on the rest of its brief, and we ask this court uh, to affirm the judgments. Thank you. We have your rebuttal time. Just briefly, Your Honors, um, I would like to address the circumstances of the offense. I think with regard to the circumstances of the offense, we have more questions than we do answers, um, given that Ms. Owens was not available to testify, apparently, and did not submit a victim impact statement. There's very little in the record about what exactly the circumstances of the offense are. Um, I think that the district attorney would have had the power and opportunity to ask for a continuance if Ms. Owens couldn't be there on that particular day. So it is a little bit frustrating um, when reading the record because there's just not a lot of information there. Um, and the only other thing I would like to touch on is the state's mention of Mr. Wilson's, he has no desire to further his education past high school. I don't think that's something that should weigh against him. He completed high school, he has a high school diploma. Um, he's finished all the compulsory education. I don't think that college is something that everyone should be required to do in order to be eligible for diversion. I think that that factor um, should weigh in his favor that he did complete his high school education. And that's all I have, Your Honors. Thank you all very much. Um, we appreciate both y'all's arguments. Your briefs were very well written. And uh, we will take the case under advisement. We will adjourn until the August docket.